Oh. 
Blessed be his glorious name, whose kingdom is forever and ever, the Messiah, Yeshua, he is Lord. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Angela, you can take that if you like. All right. So now I'm uh, going to take just a couple of minutes to uh, read through a couple of scriptures for you and uh, talk about some things that are in relation to uh, the Feast of the first fruits. Now, the first thing that I want to do is I want to read for you these, the, these two passages. There are a couple that deal with first fruits uh, specifically. One is Leviticus 23, which we will read. Um, there is another one uh, that is briefer in Deuteronomy. And then there is uh, there's a passage from Josephus, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews, that I want to read to you because that was written... Uh, he gives us a little bit of insight and tells us how the Jews of his day interpreted this and did it, uh, which is um, uh, probably about 40 or 50 years after Yeshua had died. So, and that is most assuredly from a rabbinic, uh, pharisaical standpoint. So we're going to kind of compare and, and, and contrast. And I think I want to cover two things today that I, that I hope will be good and useful for you. One is just simple practical application of the Feast of First Fruits because a lot of the stuff that we're reading today, some of it is contentious, some of it is confusing. That's why it's contentious, or vice versa, whichever. Uh, the other thing is, is that a lot of it has to do with the temple and the priesthood, which you don't have one of those today. However, you are a priest in a certain sense. Uh, so we're going to have to uh, contemplate and talk through a couple of those things. So we're going to do a little practical stuff, and then I want to do uh, just a little bit regarding the prophetic and the spiritual significance of the Feast of First Fruits. What is the Hebrew phrase for first fruits? Bikurim. Bikurim. Yeah, the Yom HaBikurim, the day of the first fruits. And how many of those are there throughout the year? There are actually three. There are three first fruits festivals, one for barley, one for wheat, and one for uh, grapes and, and fruits. But you know, if, you were, uh, if Keith were here, he'd probably tell us a little bit about a couple of additional ones, according to some of the other traditions. So the first thing I want to do to get us started is just familiarize ourselves with these couple of passages, okay? So let's start, if you would like, you can open up your books, uh, your Bibles to Deuteronomy 23, which is our proof text for the holy days of, of our Father, but I will put them up on the screen for you. So here we go, this is what we've got. Leviticus 23, starting in verse 9, <clears throat> it says here, Yah spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, 
when you enter the land I am giving you and reap its harvest, you are to bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. He will wave the sheaf before Yah for your acceptance. For acceptance or your acceptance, your translation may something have something slightly different. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Shabbat. On the day you wave the sheaf, you are to offer a year-old lamb without blemish as a burnt offering to Yah. Its grain offering is to be four quarts of fine flour mixed with oil as a fire offering to Yah, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering will be one quart of wine. You must not eat bread, roasted grain, or any new grain until this very day, and until you have brought the offering to your Elohim. This is to be a permanent statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings or all the places where you live. You are to count seven complete Sabbaths, starting from the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You are to count 50 days until the day after the seventh Sabbath and then present an offering of new grain to Yah. That is the text that encompasses the Feast of the first fruits. Now we're going to deal with, with Paul talking about uh, first fruits in a little bit because he tells us that Messiah Yeshua is the first fruits offering to Yah. Uh, this is a, we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we tackle the spiritual significance. But I want to cover some basics here real quick about who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's, I think, pretty significant that we understand it a little bit better. So here's the first thing. Who is going to do this? And I think I want to share with you this passage from, uh, from Josephus that will give us a little bit more context. Okay, Here is a, a quote from Josephus from the Antiquities of the Jews. Here's what it says. But on the second day of unleavened bread which is the 16th day of the month, they first partake of the fruits of the earth, for before that day they do not touch them. And while they suppose it proper to honor God from whom they obtain this plentiful provision, in the first place they offer the first fruits of their barley, and that in the manner following. They take a handful of the ears and dry them, then beat them small and purge the barley from the bran. They then bring one-tenth deal to the altar to God, and casting one handful of it upon the fire, they leave the rest for the use of the priest. And after this, they may publicly or privately reap their harvest. They also, at this participation of the first fruits of the earth, sacrifice a lamb as a burnt offering to God." That is from Josephus, Book 1, Chapter 3, Section 10, Section 5 of, of, of Chapter... What up? That is really confusing to me. It's kind of hard to find. You'll always see references to Josephus like that. It takes a little time to dig it up, but you can find it. So those are the basic instructions. Now, who is doing this? Some people have said, well, it's basically just one sheaf that is brought as a symbolic offering that is, is moved to the four corners. You know, you've seen that before, especially in relation to uh, Sukkot, when you take the four species and you're supposed to wave them, you know, in every direction. Pure tradition, totally fine, totally good. Um, the Hebrew word there does actually mean to kind of move to and fro in some way. But... Uh, presumably every, every year they would do this with a sheaf. Now you know that the word omer can mean two different things. One is literally a bundle of grain and the other is a dry measure. Now you might think to yourself, well if you took a bundle of a standardized type of bundle and you took all the grain off of it and pounded it flat and ground it and all that stuff and put it into an omer, that might be the... I don't know whether that is the case. You can look that up, but it makes sense. It could be, who knows. But it's either a dry measure or a, an actual sheaf of grain. 
Now, according to Josephus in the first century, uh, about, you know, he, he was born in like 37 AD, which was, you know, several years after Yeshua had lived and died. And he died in about 100 AD. He was actually, according to, here, to himself, by his own testimony, he was of a priestly family who also had some royal blood. Whether that's just blowing sunshine, I don't know. But he claims that he was of the priestly line as well as the, the kingly line. Uh, he did fight the Romans and was captured and uh, turned, to the, turned to the dark side, became a, a friend of Rome and was actually a friend of Vespasian's son Titus when he came and wiped out the temple. He was his translator in the land of Judea when Titus came and destroyed the temple. So, um, is he biased? Very likely. Is he honest with his assertions? Well, I don't see any reason for him, especially in this case, to tell us you know, what, would the, what was the common tradition in his day. I think that's totally fine. Um, Politically, I'm sure he's suspect. But what's interesting to me is, is that while a lot of rabbinic sources will say, well, they just take a sheaf that represents the grain for the whole nation and wave it, and that's good enough for everybody, Josephus seems to suggest that it does that as well as every family who has crops takes them to the temple. But consider that these people are coming from far away, a lot of them. This is one of those foot festivals where you have to travel to Jerusalem three times a year. This is one of those. And so if you're traveling from your country or even from Galilee, it's, it's not an easy journey. You know, it's 50, 60 miles away. Uh, you're, it's it going to be easy to travel with a, a, a bundle of grain? Not exactly. You know, that stuff don't travel well. I actually have some grain right here. And just handling it will cause it to fall apart. You know what I'm saying? So it would be much better to actually separate the wheat from the chaff and grind it and get it ready to go and put it in a container and put in the, you know, some, some uh, seasoning or some, um, uh, some of that uh, incense, you know, some frankincense and, and a little oil. You know? And according to Josephus, you just bring that. It's much easier to travel with. And you take your memorial portion and you put it on the fire and then you give the rest to the priest. And so the priest, you know that the priesthood collects a lot of stuff, you know, from the Israelites to, to sustain themselves. So who does this? Presumably everyone. Everyone has to come and bring something. Now, what are they doing exactly? Well, it seems that you cannot eat of any of the new crops that have come in until this ceremony has been uh, performed. So you bring a memorial portion of your offering, a sheaf uh, or an omer, as the case may be. Uh, and then the interesting thing is there's a passage in, I'm sure that you guys have probably seen this. There's a passage in Joshua where it says that they circumcised all the males. And that this is when they had crossed the Jordan River. They were about to attack the city of Jericho. And they decide, okay, we're going to circumcise all the males. And then they have Passover. And then it says on the day after the Passover, they begun to eat, they had begun to eat the new grain of the land. That's slightly confusing because you might be saying to yourself, wait a minute, how can they on the day after the Passover begin to eat the new fruit of the land because that's, uh, they're not allowed to eat of it until they wave the sheaf. So it's unlikely to me that Joshua would be violating the Torah right when they enter the land. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Talking about Joshua 5, Joshua 5, 10 and 11, yeah, describes that. Anybody have any thoughts? That puzzled me for a short while as I was contemplating... Okay, if they're supposed to calculate this out and wave the sheaf, what are they doing eating the new grain of the land in, in the day after the Passover? Seems a little abrupt. Unless the Passover was on a Sabbath day, Sabbath day <laughs> which is actually most likely. Uh, that's, that answers it. That, that makes it feasible. Uh, I don't know why that didn't occur to me, but that puzzled, I scratched my head about that for a short time. 
so yeah, that's, that's a fascinating passage. Uh, so now, when they do this and when you're supposed to do it is highly contentious. And you know that in our fellowship, we don't often discuss calendar issues. Neither are we going to. Uh, it's just too contentious. Uh, and frankly, if you've studied this at all, and I know that many of you do, because it, and I do too, I need to every year look up something about the calendar. You know, it's just, it's foreign to me to, to observe a Hebrew calendar. I have not been doing that, but for more than, you know, 12 years. But even still, every single year I have to look it up. I have to reread this passage from uh, Leviticus and just re-familiarize myself and, re, you know, remember, okay, there's this and then there's that. And, oh, yeah, it's this day. And I have to, you know, I get together with a couple of you uh, after Sukkot and we talk and we hash it out and we plan the calendar for the next year. Because there's some, there's, there's some issues that we got to work out. So that's one of the things that is a challenge, especially as a Hebrew Roots congregation, where we're all, you know, we've, we've learned a little bit of Hebrew and we're smarter than anybody who ever spoke Hebrew, who spoke Hebrew. You know, we figured it all out. So the thing is, is that uh, this is a highly controversial issue, especially regarding the counting of the Omer. Are you guys familiar with this? How many of you know that there is a highly contentious break within Judaism and Christianity regarding the, specifically the counting of the Omer. It's, hard, hard, it's highly contentious. Um, there are three, essentially three ideas regarding this. The Sadducees said, when the Passover happens, you've got the high Shabbat of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Wherever the weekly Sabbath falls, the day immediately after that, you begin your count, that's where you start. The Essenes, God bless them, had a whole different thing. They were like, yeah, it's actually on the weekly Shabbat, but a week after the Festival of Unleavened Bread. So we just get through the week of Unleavened Bread, that's a whole separate thing. And then the Sabbath that follows the week of Unleavened Bread, that's when we'll start to count the Omer. That's when we do our first fruits. So they're a little different. And then the Pharisees said, no. It's actually on the, you start counting at the high Shabbat. You start counting at the high Shabbat, not the weekly Shabbat. Now, when I read that to you, it may not have been abundantly clear to you right off of the bat, you know, what is actually happening there. I would assume that the Hebrew text, when it's talking about a high Shabbat, generally will tell you. This is a special kind of a deal. Uh, so this is a little bit, little bit weird. But I think, unfortunately, like I said, it's contentious, but this is the one area in this fellowship where we do break from the Hillel 2 calendar. And most Messianics do. Most Messianics do. I cannot explain for you with any reasonable certainty why the rabbis and the Pharisees decided that it would be best to count um, from the high Shabbat instead of the weekly Shabbat. Now, there are some people out there with some ideas, uh, not terribly friendly ideas toward the Jews, but they suppose that the Jews have not terribly friendly ideas toward the Christians. And they have suggested that the Jews decided to tweak it just to spite us. Now, is that possible? <laughs> Well, I suppose it is. Uh, have they ever done anything to spite us before? No? Anyone? Huh? Yes, they have. Um, some people presume that, because <clears throat> you know uh, when Yeshua died, and we've calculated this many times, this is a big topic of discussion, that you can't have Yeshua dying on Friday and raising from the dead on Sunday. It doesn't really work. You, unless he just was speaking totally metaphorically and he didn't really mean, I'm going to be in the ground for three days and three nights, just like the prophet Jonah said. That would make him kind of flubbing the numbers a little bit. But we don't believe that that's the case. So what we're more than likely looking at here, and I think you guys have already seen this, is that Yeshua most likely was killed on a Wednesday afternoon and that he spent 
three days literally and three nights literally in the ground and was resurrected when? Don't know. Well, don't know. That's a good. That's a good question. That's a good assertion. Brett says on the ninth hour of the Shabbat. That's actually a pretty good idea, because uh, all we do know for sure is that Marys, a couple of Marys, went to the tomb as the sun was rising on the first day of the week. That would be Sunday morning, and he was already gone. When did he actually resurrect? We can't be certain about that. Some people presume that it was the previous night as the sun was going down leading into Shabbat. That's entirely possible. You still would have three days and three nights in the grave. But here's the thing. With our calculation of how to calculate Passover, or not Passover, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, and, the, and the, yeah, the first fruits, the first fruits offering will always happen on Sunday, on Sunday morning, every time. And the text, to me, is really clear about that. Very clear. I mean, it says you're going to count 50 days until you reach the day after the Sabbath, 50 days later. Well, if you're starting your count on the 16th of the month, that don't work. That doesn't work at all. So here's the thing. Why would the Jews decide, you know, it's going to happen on the, so we're going to start counting on the 16th? I've never found a good answer for that. But I do know that the only real historical evidence that we have of what they were doing in the first century is from Josephus. But some people say, well, the Jews did that because they didn't want their first fruits offering to be happening on Sunday because that's when Yeshua was raised from the dead. I can understand that that might be a contentious issue. If every year... The Jews are presenting their wave offering to, you know, Father in the temple saying, here's the first fruits offering, and all the Christians are going, you know that's about Yeshua, don't you? They're going to say, all right, to heck with you guys. We are switching the date from Sunday. We're not doing the high Shabbat. We're not, we're not doing the Sabbath anymore. We're doing the high Sabbath. We're going to reinterpret the scriptures to break away from you Christians, and we're doing it differently. Could that happen? Sure it could. Sure it could. Some people say, well, that's just, that's not very nice to say that the Jews would do that. I get it, and I'm not saying that they did. I'm saying it's possible. And, you know, here's something that's kind of interesting to me. You guys are aware of the Amidah prayers. These are the, the prayers that have been in circulation uh, for a long, long time. Okay, those are the 18 benedictions. These are the... 18 little sections that are prayed by religious Jews three times a day. They suppose that Daniel was bowing and praying towards Jerusalem three times a day, saying those prayers. That tradition goes back that far. But here's the interesting thing. One little stanza of that prayer was added later. Exactly when, we're not sure, but it's been this way for a long time. And it is stanza number 12 of the benediction. It's called the Berkat Haminim. You guys familiar with it? Mm -hmm. So here's the interesting thing. There are 18 sections to this prayer, and they're amazing. I love the Amidah prayer. You've heard me over the years actually read it for you. It takes about 15 minutes, and it is a, a canned prayer that is written and has been read by Jews at least twice a day. Ultra-religious people would probably read it three times a day. It has amazing, most of it is scripture, but it's just talking about the glories of our Father in a lot of different categories. It's a wonderful prayer, except for number 12, which was added later, obviously, because I'll read it to you now and you'll be able to tell, yeah, yeah, that couldn't have been there before Yeshua. Here's what it says. Here is the blessing. For the apostates, let there be no hope, and uproot the kingdom of arrogance speedily and in our days. May the Nazarenes and the sectarians perish as in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of life and not be written together with the righteous. You are praised, O Lord, who subdues the arrogant. <coughs> it's not exactly a blessing. Well, I mean, it's a ble blessed are you, Yehovah, uh, who destroys our enemies. Okay, yeah, if... And you know, Paul tells us pretty clearly, hey, these people are beloved for the sake of the fathers. 
for the sake of the gospel, they are your enemies. That's a difficult thing to balance, unfortunately. And people often ask me, well, what do you think about uh, you know, the Jews in Israel? I don't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Those are God's people, and you will not ever hear me talking about them in a bad way. It's, I have to say, hey, what I've seen happening over there over the last 70 years, Father has his hand on those people. What are they doing? I don't know. Are they totally right with God? Not even close. Are they worse than us? Very possibly. I mean, they're probably equal to us. But we've got a, how, what, is, what is the percentage of our population that's righteous and religious? Not much. Theirs is pretty much the same. So I'm not saying that they're a righteous nation. But they are Father's people. For the sake of the fathers, for the sake of the ancestors, I say Father's hand is upon them. What is he doing with them? I don't know. Is that Israel? That's a portion of it. Here's the other portion right here. And people like you, Christians, Hebrew Roots people, they're scattered all over the planet. That is Israel. Those people are also Israel, a portion of it. So that's what I'll say about that. Now, so kind of coming back to this thing, well, why would they, uh, you know, why would they change it to the 16th? It could be that that's the reason why. I don't know. It's contentious, though. But that's the when, and that's all I'll say about that. Comments, questions, concerns? You okay with that? Who is it? It's Mike. What's up, Mike? Hey. So you kind of made the point that um, potentially it was a separation so that they wouldn't have this day correlating with the uh, resurrection and Yeshua being the first fruits. Right. Um, when you mentioned the Essenes, Sadducees, and Pharisees having kind of a different thought about when the day occurred, when, mm -hmm. what are those sources and when was that debate happening? Was it after Yeshua? <clears throat> yes, if, as far as I know. Uh, that is kind of really hard information to come by. Uh, there's really only a couple of, because you know, I know you know, and probably a lot of people know, that a lot of the traditions of the Jews were oral. They were orally transmitted until when? Does anybody know? When they were actually written down? It's like 200 A.D., they didn't really get together, and it was after the destruction of the temple when they were in the diaspora that they were like, okay, we are losing the traditions that we had carried on orally for so long that we need to write them down. But you don't have written sources until, I think it's almost 200 AD. So the authoritative scriptures about when this is happening is quite challenging to find out. You really only have... I think four sources that I'm aware of, Mike, and I think one of them is Josephus, one of them is Philo, and then some writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because anything that was written by the rabbis wasn't written down until like 200 AD. So those are really contentious issues, and I did not go that far back and dig into the original sources myself. I looked at uh, a summation, uh, a white paper about those who had. Tim Haig and M. McGee, uh, McGee, you probably know about A.K. McGee, A. K. McGee, McGee or something like that. Uh, these are pretty good Hebrew scholars who, they dig deep. So you can check into it if you want to take a look. Does that help, Mike? Does that answer your question slightly? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so yeah, definitely contentious stuff. But where are these things happening? Well, this is happening in the place where Yah chooses to place his name. It has to happen in Jerusalem, right? Can't just do this anywhere. Why are we doing it? Why are we commanded to do this? It literally says that it or you may be accepted. Uh, you can look up that Hebrew word for accepted. It has something to do with being uh, honored, that it would be blessed. Uh, so that the question is, we're not exactly clear. If you look at your translation of that, it might seem to suggest that the, the, that the wave offering itself would be accepted. But some translations say that you yourself may be accepted. I tend to lean more towards that you may be accepted. Um, remember that these instructions are coming uh, to the Israelites 
and that they are about to head towards the land. They had previously, and if you read your Torah portion this, this the last Shabbat from Leviticus uh, 17, uh, 16, 17, and 18, you've got something about them not worshiping the goat demons that they had been worshiping in Egypt, okay? So it's very likely that they had been corrupted during their time in Egypt. We have many references to that, that they had mixed their worship uh, and had begun, and, 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 and frankly, the uh, goat demons is literally Seir. It's just a hairy goat. Now, we also know that the, when they passed the sacrifice, the Passover lamb, you know, Pharaoh had told them, well, just do that in the land here. So after, make your sacrifices here in the land. Well, like, we can't do that because we're going to kill some goats and you guys worship goats. They'll stone us to death. They, they, we're not, they're not going to put up with us slaughtering their national animal. Uh, so it's likely that some of the Hebrews, at least, worshipped their goat god and that they were still doing so in the wilderness. It is altogether common. And obviously one of those big things that those gods of the ancient world were most especially related with is fertility and plentitude, you know, making crops grow, making women fertile to give birth to children and all these other things. These are big things in the ancient world. And I personally think that if you are not making a sacrifice of your first fruits to the Father and giving Him credit for anything that is growing on your patch of ground, then you might have the tendency to say, uh, somebody else gave this to me. Some other God did this for me. They were still doing it. You can read in the prophets how they were giving uh, Asherah and Baal and Dagon, all these other gods they were worshiping, and that is a central focus of the worship of those gods, is giving Him glory and honor and praise for providing. I think that this is a distinction point. This is a, a separation. This is a dedication saying, look, you'll be accepted if you give thanks to Father for what you have. Uh, and I think that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, I would say, I'd say, I'd say that was probably the best I could do, is just say that this is probably important in opposition to the practice of other gods, the practices of other gods. Now, I come to notes and application, okay? Um, you know that there are contentious calendar issues in the Hebrew Roots movement, and frankly, within Judaism. And I would say what's important, and I have continued to emphasize to you over the last 12 years, which is, I don't care what you do regarding how you calculate this and that, and I'm citing this sliver. No, no, it's a sliver. No, no, it's a conjunction. No, no, the barley's not a Vivia. No, no, we're counting from this high Shabbat. I don't care what you do. What I do care about is that you're here, that you're fellowshipping with us. We have to all get on the same page in some way, shape, or form, or we're just not going to be able to fellowship together. And I have determined as the fellowship leader, if you want to put me in air quotes, that... Uh, the easiest way to do that is, is to just go by the, the Hebrew calendar, the Jewish calendar, the Hillel II. Why is that? Because anybody who is a Christian out in the regular world of mainstream Christianity who's just kind of getting a little interested in this stuff, maybe they saw a video, somebody shared something with them, and they're like, okay, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread and all this stuff, well, that sounds fascinating. I wonder if we could find a fellowship that does that. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to do a Google search. They're not going to know anything about the calendar and how am I going to find this stuff out. They're just going to go to Google and say, when is Passover? And Google's going to feed them the Hillel 2 calendar. So I want to be on the same page with anybody who's seeking to find out information about this. But this is the one area where I say, gosh, the text is just so abundantly clear that this is not being counted from the day after the high Shabbat of, of unleavened bread. So, but you know what? If they find us because they're looking up Passover on Google, we're going to fill them in. Okay, yeah, we're doing Yom HaBikarim. We're doing the first fruits, but we're not doing it on that day because it would be a co strange coincidence to have the first fruits on Sunday, uh, which it's always on a Sunday. So here's uh, some other pra practical application. Um, can we make some kind of an offering. I mean, we're not farmers. This is not an agrarian 
culture that we live in, nobody, practically nobody's growing stuff. They're not growing their own crops. We don't have anything that we're going to be able to take. Does that obviate us from being able to take part in this? There's also no temple. So clearly you're not going to be able to take something to a priest. Is there any way that you can practically apply this? You can spiritualize it and say, well, Yeshua was you know, resurrected. For a week. I guess we could just say, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you can do that. You can just say, oh, that's cool that there's this unique uh, connection there. And that's what most Hebrew roots people do. They just say, oh, that's interesting that there's a connection there. But there's nothing really practical that they can do. Is there, is there anything practical that you can do to like celebrate the Feast of First Fruits? You can't take grain and wave it somewhere. Bethany, you got an idea? Well, but wait. The microphone? Hand her a microphone. Thank you, Thelma. Here comes Bethany, everybody. Tell us what's up, Bethany. We, so we grew up a little bit differently because we did grow up on a farm, so we did have first fruits of stuff. Yeah. And so what we did was, I know it's quoted somewhere, is give to the fatherless, the widow, or the sojourner. We also brought it to our church to give it in whatever potluck or everything. Yeah. Give it. We gave our first, um, like, if we had goats that year and there was a male firstborn, we gave it to somebody if they needed a goat or... In our case, this year, we I still had a bull. And what we did was he was the firstborn of his mom. So what we did is we made sure all the money that came from that bull went to Passover or feast mm. stuff. So okay. we made sure to give stuff to, of that bull to people, but also that that was given in expenses to all the feasts yeah. is what we determined to do with that. I like that. Um, now that's that's fascinating because you're in a, a slightly agrarian part of uh, New Mexico. Your family was from there. And I think if you were um, an agrarian type, lived in a small town that had a farming community, like you know where Angel Angela grew up in southwestern Colorado, there's a lot of ranches, a lot of, they're growing a lot of wheat there, frankly, to be quite honest. Uh, you, I suppose you could do that. Uh, Michael, what do you say? Uh, in Deuteron Deuteronomy 26, 12, it says, When you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, give it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. So I kind of was looking at that like, well, that's something that we could still do. We could still reach out to those people and take care of them. Okay, yeah. Um, I think that's a great idea, and that's really tied with what Bethany was saying. Yeah, yeah. totally agreed. So question then becomes, though, you're not a rancher. You don't have animals. You don't grow crops. What do you do? Nothing? Is this specific to agriculture? There's two instructions. Wait. Wait for it. Thelma, who's got the microphone? Uh, Isaac, jump up, big dog. Thank you, sir. So in Deuteronomy 14, it starts out in um, 23, and you shall eat before Yahuwah your Elohim, the place where he chooses to make his name dwell, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstlings of your herds and your sheep, so you learn to fear Yahuwah your Elohim always. But when the way is too long for you, so that you're not able to bring the tithe, or when the place where Yahuwah your Elohim chooses to put his name is too far from you when Yahuwah, your Elohim, is blessing you. Then you shall give it in silver and shall take the silver in your hand and go to the place which Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses. So that's similar to what I was saying where they would grind the wheat, put it, it's just easier to travel. Or if you can't travel, then you give it in silver, which kind of lines up with like tithe instructions in right. general, or Hebrews 13 which, you know, you offer up a slaughter offering of praise to Elohim, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's kind of spiritualizing, but at the sure. same time, is it? Sure. Now, I thank you. I, I like what you're saying, Brett, and I don't necessarily have a problem with that. And I think that there are several scriptures which do talk about a tithe that are specific to a tenth part, an actual portion of your uh, crops or whatever, that you would give to the homeless, the widow, the orphan, the priesthood, and stuff like that. This is not exactly a tithe. It's actually not much. You know, it's it's like a uh, it's like a, just a 
it's a, a memorial portion that's kind of like a symbolic act. So I think that you guys are absolutely right when you're talking about giving and, and, and dealing with a tithe, but this almost seems to be like a, just a, a, a spiritual signifier, just saying this is symbolic of something else, mm-hmm. an acknowledgement of Yah giving you what you have. So uh, do you see any way that that because this is specifically tied to the priesthood and the altar. So does that mean that we really can't do much with that? It could. And it could. Uh, it, it, you know what, what comes to my mind, and I think you look at a, an agrarian culture, and if you lived in an agrarian town or something like that, you grazed animals or whatever, yeah, you could, you could do that. But I think, frankly, I would say... You can't really give this to a priest because we don't really have any priests. And I'm not, I know that we are kind of priests, a kingdom of priests to our father, as Paul would say. But I'm a little bit uncomfortable for this purpose designating somebody as a priest. You know what I'm saying? And that's also specific to Yah in the place where he puts his name. So here's what I would suggest. I do think that it might be appropriate, and I'll just throw this out there and you can tell me your thoughts, that you might say just publicly in a situation like this, I have these things and I acknowledge that Father has given them, every one of them, to me. I have nothing of myself. You know, I have a wife, and two fine sons. I have a home to live in. I have food to eat. I have water. I have clothing. I have air conditioning. I have a car to drive. I have so many things that I am grateful for, but every single one of them came from him. That, I think, is the important thing, is not to say, is to humble, it's a little bit of a, a humbling a humbling act of saying, no, it's not because I'm smart. It's not because I'm a good businessman. It's not because I went to college. It's not because I live in a, a, a capitalist country versus a socialist country. It's because Father has given me every single thing I have, period. That might be a way to acknowledge and publicly acknowledge that you have nothing that Father has not given you. And if you have anything that you think he didn't give you, that's something you need to work on. So that's what I would say is that maybe the first fruits, I mean, could you take a small portion? I mean, you could get a quarter out of your pocket and go, this is something, this represents what Father has given me. I wouldn't go that far because then you're crossing over that boundary of, you know, well, I'm not doing it at the right place and I'm not giving it to the right person. I think just maybe spiritually acknowledging the amazing benefits and blessings that you have, acknowledging it verbally, that's what I would like to see done. That's what I do to just take this opportunity to say, I have nothing without him. I, have, I would have absolutely nothing if he hadn't given it to me, period. And that's a, serious, that's a serious thing. Any ideas, comments, questions, or concerns on that issue? Does that sound okay to you guys? Does it sound blasphemous? Uh, are you on board? What do you think? And I'm not suggesting that you have to do it. I'm just looking at practical ways that we can actually do something with this day other than just saying, oh, that's neat. Yeshua was raised on first fruits, and that's what they used to do in the temple. It, it kind of disconnects it from you in a certain way. Uh, I think... Just being able to to be grateful and to give thanks, recognizing what you have been given by Father is a a good step in the right direction. That's all I would say. Um, Now, we come to, I just want to briefly say that this, when you reach that Sabbath day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, this is when you begin your Omer count. And I know that some of you have uh, counted the Omer. You're supposed to count 49 days or seven complete weeks and then on the 50th day is Pentecost, is Shavuot. That's when the Holy Spirit came down. That's when the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. This is significant stuff. And so counting is uh, pretty important. And I'm going to come back to the idea of counting in just a moment. 
Um, but I, 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 this is our practice here in this household. And this is the, uh, the little pitcher that we have. And we literally just went and got and found some heads of grain. This is just wheat. Now, I don't have barley. Sue me. If you can find some barley, give me some. Uh, but this is what I do. I have a stalk right up there on that shelf uh, of 50 stalks of wheat. And every day from that Sabbath, from tomorrow after that Sabbath until the 50th one, the 49th one, I will actually just take one every evening at dinner time, is what we normally do, and drop one in there as everyone says, Blessed are you, you of our God, who has commanded us to count the Omer. That's it. Some people might do one of those little chains, you know, that they used to have when they were kids. It's like counting the 12 days of Christmas or whatever that is, you know. Um, I know Cadence and Hayden were like counting down days until their marriage with a, a little thing like that. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's what we do in our household to count the Omer leading up to Shavuot. Um, so you can see that last night stock number one went in there. That was the first day. Stock number two goes in tonight because tonight into tomorrow is the second day of the counting of the Omer. And 50 days from now will be uh, a Sunday. And we will always have Shavuot on a Sunday. So there's that. There's all the practical application. Now I want to deal briefly with uh, some of the spiritual and the prophetic significance. And I won't, I won't carry on too long. I know that you're, you might be tired. It's 8 o'clock already. Um, I want to read for you two little passages of Scripture as we are discussing this, okay? Here's the first one, and this is in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 says this, But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah all will be made alive, but each in his own order. Messiah, the firstfruits, afterward at his coming, those who belong to Messiah. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to Elohim the Father, when he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. So, Messiah, the first fruits, and then everyone else who belongs to Messiah at his return. Okay, now the second passage I want to read is from 1 Thessalonians, which you probably already know. Here it is. He says in chapter 4, verse 13, We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, concerning those who have already died in Messiah, those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, in the same way Elohim will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or died through Yeshua. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Master. Paul is telling us that he received this information directly from Yeshua. We who are still alive at the Master's return, coming, will certainly have no advantage or will not precede those who have died or fallen asleep. For the master himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of Elohim, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the master in the air. And so we will always be with the Master. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, I think something interesting. Have you heard about, what have you heard about this day of the blowing of the trumpets? Uh, what is that day referred to as? Yom Teruah. Yom Teruah. Now, there's another one of those is it, do you find it interesting that Jews do not call it Yom Teruah? What do they call it? Rosh Hashanah. They call it Rosh Hashanah. Do you know that there, that's a little bit of a contentious issue? Notice that the days of resurrection are, have a little bit of mystery and contention about them. What else have you heard that day called? In, among prophetic circles and people who know the prophecies, 
What do they sometimes call that day of Yom Teruah? The day that... Kings. Maybe, yeah. No man knows. Yes. Yeah, the, day the day that no one knows. Now, why would they... And they, and they refer that to Matthew, 20, Matthew 24 or 25, where Yeshua's like, yeah, no man knows the day or the hour. Why did they say that? You have to visually sight the moon. You can't count the first day of that month until you visually sight the moon. Notice something interesting about these two days. The Feast of First Fruits, on which Yeshua was the first fruits of the resurrection, and the day that all of everyone else who was his when he returns will be resurrected. There's mystery there. Mm -hmm. There's not a specific calendar date. It's a sighting or it's a counting, and it's contentious, and it's somewhat mysterious. Well, does that make sense? It does to me. It does to me that you have, and you know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Essenes were fighting about whether there even was a resurrection in the days of Yeshua, right? So it makes sense to me that this, this uh, resurrection issue is slightly contentious. And it makes sense to me that in the wisdom of our Father, the days on which the resurrection takes place are also slightly contentious. It's just interesting. Um, here's something that's also interesting. Notice that they're receiving these instructions in the Torah by Moses directly at the mouth of Yah, but they're getting them in the wilderness. And it says, when you enter the land. How long is it going to be before they enter the land? 40 years. 40 years. So they're not really going to be able to perform this for 40 years. That whole generation will not even be able to perform this ritual because they're not going to be in any situation to be able to farm anything while they're wandering around. So I find it fascinating that they do not actually get to observe this happening until Joshua takes them into the Promised Land. Forty years later. What is Joshua's real name? Yeshua. Yeshua. You cannot observe the first fruits of the resurrection until Yeshua brings you into the land. That's fascinating. It's also fascinating to me that if you calculate the time that Yeshua died to when he is theoretically going to return, and lots of people speculate about this, how many Jubilee cycles is that? 2,000 years, so divided by 50, 100 years. I thought it was 50, 100 years, right? That is, how, what is 50 times what equals 2,000? How much? 40. That's correct. What does 40 symbolize in the Bible? Covenant. Hmm? Covenant time. Could be, yeah. That's one idea. Who said that? Your wife. What did you say, Angela? Exile and difficulty. Judgment. Yes. Why did they have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years? Because they got judged. They were in a period of difficulty from, from acting stupid. Are we in the wilderness? Yes. We are also in the wilderness, in exile. So, 50-year cycles, it's interesting that we're counting 50-day cycles right at this very time. And in a 50-year cycle, which is the Jubilee, the Yovel in Hebrew, you count up 40 of those, and you equal 2,000. That would put you, this is some people have said, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. This is Peter, right? So if you say a day is like a thousand years, and there's 6,000 years of mankind roaming around the earth, and then in the 7,000th year there is the millennium, the day of rest, if you want to call it that, then you can perhaps look at that as an interesting prophetic shadow picture and say, well, then I would expect that we have been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 jubilees and that pretty soon we are rapidly approaching 
the 2,000 year mark since Yeshua re left this planet. The, f the 40th Jubilee is coming up pretty soon. I don't know exactly when because counting the Yovels and the, and the, and, and the, uh, the cycles of seven, I know that people say, oh, I know when it is. I, maybe they do. I don't know. But everybody thinks they know when it is. And there are lots of different ideas out there. So that's, that's certainly fascinating. But I think that there's a lot of very interesting parallels between Yeshua and resurrection and, this, and Joshua taking them into the land. And it's just, it's just fascinating to me. Um, that's all I think that I wanted to say about that. Yes, it is. I have nothing else for you. <laughs> that was it. I, I, it's fascinating to me, and I hope that uh, you will consider and contemplate and think about how you might tangibly observe first fruits, Yom HaBikarim, for yourself. I'd love to see you give thanks to Yah for everything that you have in your life. Give thanks to Yah that He has actually freed you from the realm of death by the resurrection of His Son from the grave with a promise that that's just, hey, that's a down payment. You know what I'm saying? That's a, that's a symbolic down payment. Everything else is coming shortly. Just wait for it. We don't grieve like the rest who have no hope. We are going to be resurrected if you belong to Him. If you don't, you'll still be resurrected. Just later. And to what? I don't know. Doesn't sound good. Right? I'd like to be in the first resurrection. Blessed is He who has a part in the first resurrection. That's my goal, is to be having a part in the first resurrection. For all I know, I might still be alive when he arrives and caught up in the air. That'd be neat. We'll see. I'm excited about that. Any comments, questions, or concerns for the good of the order? All right. Well, tomorrow is the final day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I hope that this uh, Moedim, this season, this spiritual season has been a blessing to you in your observance of Passover and unleavened bread. I hope that you have uh, removed the leaven from your homes, both physically and spiritually. You know, we have, I have had some wonderful, wonderful conversations. It seems interesting to me. I was contemplating this. I had a lot of great conversations with you guys during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and a lot of those conversations were very practical conversations about how do we do this? How do we do that? How do I understand this? And you know what was interesting about those conversations? They always seem to revolve around some idea that we had that came from somewhere else. It was not scripture. It was just something else that we picked up from somewhere. Maybe it was a book we read. Maybe it was a movie we watched. Maybe it was a pastor. Maybe it was our doctrines of our former church. But do you know how many conversations I have had in this Passover and Unleavened Bread season where we're like, you know, just hashing out issues and somebody's like, well, yeah, but it, it says this. And I'm like, does it? Does it really say that? Well, of course it does. Find it. It doesn't exist. Okay, this is what we, this is the whole point of removing the leaven. Remember, leaven most as closely is associated with doctrine in the Bible. This is the doctrines of men. Because you got these ideas in your mind, it's like, well, that's what the Bible says. Gosh, unfortunately, in so many cases, you're wrong. It does not say that. And you just think it does, because somebody told you it does. And that's a really dangerous position to be in. Because somebody told the disciples, the Messiah doesn't die. He doesn't need to be resurrected. What are you talking about? The Messiah is going to come and he's going to destroy our enemies and he's going to set up a kingdom and it's all going to be great. They were seriously mistaken. They had some serious leaven that caused them all to stumble and fall. Caused one of them to betray him. Cause another one to deny him. 
lots of serious problems because they had some leaven of ideas that they had inherited from their forefathers that were just flat wrong. Everything that they thought was a literal interpretation turned out to be spiritual. Everything they thought was spiritual turned out to be real and tangible. They were confused because they just listened to what they were told and said, that's the truth. Compare it. Look at your scriptures. Test everything that you think you know. But don't go crazy. Because I know a lot of you go crazy. You're like, gosh, if they lied to me about this, what else did they lie to me about? Okay, yes, I get it. But don't go off the deep end. Fair enough? <laughs> Anybody else have anything? All right, let's pray. Holy Father, we love you and thank you for all of your tremendous and powerful blessings. We thank you for the Feast of uh, Unleavened Bread, for Yom HaKippurim, uh, the first fruits. We thank you for our, the Passover of you, the Messiah Yeshua who died to rescue us from death and sin and who rose again to show victory over death and sin and that he is coming for us to take care of us, to help us to, to enter his kingdom, and he will give us life. We definitely believe this, and we thank you for this powerful and amazing truth. This is something we can cling to. We thank you, Father, for all of these people who are yours. We thank you for the tremendous blessings that you have bestowed on each and every one of us. We have nothing that we have not received from you. We thank you, Father, for everything. We thank you for each other especially, and I pray that you'll help us to encourage one another, support one another, sharpen one another in our understanding of your word, to challenge one another, and encourage and support one another. We love you and thank you for all your tremendous blessings. In the name of our Messiah Yeshua, amen.